I'm Denise. She's a non-fiction editor. And I'm Louise. She's a fiction editor. And together, we're the Editing Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Editing Podcast. This week, we're absolutely thrilled to welcome a guest who's been a long-time colleague of ours and who has an absolute ton of experience to share. That's right. Louise Bolletin started her working life at 16 as a journalist. Ten years later, she became a magazine sub-editor, worked abroad in comms for a while, and then took a position as an in-house editor at a financial institution. And then in 2004, she went freelance. Yeah, and then over the last 17 years, Louise has specialised primarily in finance and business editing and newspaper sub-editing. Aside from her press clients, she's worked for corporates, academics, indie fiction authors and mainstream publishers. Now, we've been itching to get Louise on the podcast to talk about sub-editing for quite a while now. (laughs) Um, But we're also going to have a little chat about how editing has changed over the decades. Yeah, so Louise, a very warm welcome to the Editing Podcast. Hello. Hello. (laughs) Hi. Thanks for having me on. (laughs) <laughs> You're very, very welcome. So, Louise, the word editor is used widely in the newspaper and magazine publishing world. Editor, commissioning editor, production editor, sub-editor, pitch editor. What do all of those different editors actually do? Well, most, most of them aren't actually editors as such. It's just that that's their job title. Um, they're not necessarily actually editing. Obviously, you know, the person who's in charge of the whole publication is the editor, the editor in chief, really, if you want Mm -hmm. to frame it that way. But a commissioning editor doesn't actually edit, they commission features. Um, You don't have a commissioning editor who works, um, you know, on the news side of things. If it's a newspaper, then that would just be head of news or something. The commissioning Mm -hmm. editor is someone who actually commissions features, either either from in-house staff or from freelancers. Production editor, likewise, doesn't edit. They're just in charge of overseeing the production side of a publication. So making sure all the pages are laid out properly and, and so on, and that the pages go off to the printer on time, et cetera, et cetera. The picture editor is basically the person in charge of photographs and images so again they're not editing they're just responsible for you know going through the going through the picture archives and finding suitable photos or other images or they might commission in-house graphic designers to mock up an infographic or something like that again they're not actually editing the people who actually do the editing are the sub-editors and the chief sub-editor will kind of oversee that whole process and yeah so yeah, so it's, it's editors are fairly loose term, but from what you're saying, it's a, it's a title more than anything, and it's it really is. the sub editors that are dealing with the text. Yeah, that's so, that's exactly it. Right. Yeah. So, would you say that is sub editing the same as copy editing, or is the sub editor required to you know, carry out different tasks? I mean, there's lots of questions around this. Really, uh, what what are sort of different bits and pieces that a sub editor would have to tackle and and obviously, the, the big question with news are are the timescales any different? Yeah, well, a time timescales depends on the kind of publication, and I'll touch on that in a moment. But mm-hmm. I would say sub editing is is there there is an overlap with copy editing, but it's also incredibly different. If I'm working uh, before the pandemic, I worked on a weekly newspaper as freelance, and I would go in one day a week to sub edit the paper, um, and I would do absolutely everything. I wouldn't just be editing the text that the reporters had filed but I would be writing headlines putting crossheads in which is subheadings um, I would be writing uh, captions for the photographs you know those are all things that a copy editor wouldn't do mm-hmm. um, when I'm copy editing for a client um, I'm really just very focused on the text and I might make some suggestions about would this work as a chapter title for example mm-hmm. um, but it, I wouldn't I wouldn't interfere at that level sub editing is is directly interventionist and we're kind of kind of the, the front line for protecting the copy once we have it it doesn't go back to the journalists who wrote it well it might do very very rare circumstances like big name columnists or something yeah. but generally once a reporter has filed their copy it comes to the sub editors and that's it they've lost control of it at that point so it is it is very much it's an interventionist thing mm-hmm. um once i have my hands on somebody's news story 
that's it. I will do whatever I want to it with, within the framework of how, how the newspaper style guide works and so on. Um, and within the framework of the editor's code of practice, um, which is what the newspaper industry has to abide by. Um, yeah, so we look, we, we do a lot of different elements, um, like headlines and so on, as I said, time scales, um, that can vary with a, with a daily newspaper, you're just, the pressure is on. It's especially now that most newspapers are digital first, print second. Mm. So a story mm. might come in and you might have to turn it around within 10 minutes so it can go live on the internet. Gotcha. Um, when I, when I worked in magazines, I worked on a weekly magazine for a long time in the late eighties. Um, and we would often be working on features up to six weeks ahead. Um, because their freelancers would, you know, deliver deliver a story, um, and it would come onto the subs desk, and that we might be spending an hour, maybe even two hours, editing it, and then it would go off for page layout and so on. But we might also be editing sort of the front of the magazine's news pages only two to three days before it goes to press. So those timescales can be quite elastic. Um, mm. And with monthly magazines, you, you're looking at even longer kind of time frames for actually editing stories. But certainly with a newspaper, um, the pressure is on to turn things around really, really quickly. That is, gosh, you got to be on your game then, haven't you? You really do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even if you turn up after a, a night out on the lash the night before, <laughs> yeah. and you have a hangover, you've got to get into, the, you've got to get in there and start start work and just be completely on the ball. Yeah, mm, yeah. Mm. you can't miss anything because there are legal issues around what you're editing, yeah, the news yeah. and so on. So you, yeah, you have to, you have to be on top of your game. You really do, Louise. Yeah. That control for issue you mentioned is really different I mean th that's certainly very different to the experience I have I, I always yeah. see that my authors have control over the text but um very different a game of foot it seems when it comes to sub editing but uh, what I what struck me about what you just said there was I mean if are there sub editors who work freelance because you were working in house at that point but what happens in terms of are there freelance sub editors? And if yes, so, how yes. do they manage that issue of it being on those incredibly tight deadlines? Yeah. Um, when they might be juggling multiple clients. Have you got yeah. had experience of that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, back when I first started sub editing, I, I was in-house, and then I changed publications and I went freelance at the same time. This was back in the late 1980s, and that weekly magazine that I was just talking about I actually freelanced there for a year and a half okay. and I went in four days a week so I was being paid by the day for a shift um, that that tradition has been around in the print press for a very very long time all, almost all newspapers have shifts for freelancers to work on the subbing desk um, and even even if you work remotely you might still be offered um, subbing shifts where you're just working from home um, I worked on a magazine for a business to business magazine for about eight or nine years where I was just basically doing the sub editing in word at home. Um, it, we were a very small team, editor, sub editor and page designer. Um, and he would the, the the editor would send me the copy. I would sub it in word, send it back to him. Then it would go to the page designer, and then I would get the page proofs back in PDF to proofread. Um, and that kind, and I and I might have been working for other publications like that at the same time. So, so you were you juggling. Know, it's a, it's it, it's not an uncommon thing for sub editors to work freelance, and I would say it's it's probably increased if anything in recent years because so many publications are getting rid of their sub editors and unfortunately you can see that when you read the news online these days that things have not been edited well um, and they're just full of errors and typos and things yeah yeah I, what I find interesting about what you, you were talking about um, earlier Louise is this thing about you um, once the journalist has handed the text over it's yours it's and it's so different from the the author editor relationship that mm -hmm. lots of other editors will be familiar with where you're all about you know working with the client and preserving their voice and it's very much more collaborative this sounds very different that you know there's a handoff and and I wonder if that ever if there's ever 
tension there between journalist and editor about what you do to their text afterwards or if it's just accepted that that's the way things are uh, yeah they, well they can be particularly if it's like a well a well-known journalist I mean mm. uh, I've, I've, I know I've said this before in public but um some journalists can get very very precious about what they've written um mm -hmm. and if anyone would like a good example of that I would say go on to your favorite search engine and type in Giles Corrin who is that's who I was thinking of <laughs> that's yeah, who I yeah. had in my head <laughs> <laughs> well, he famously sent an incredibly rude and sweary and angry missive to the subs desk complaining about about the last the last sentence of his review having been completely ruined. Um, and in response, the um, sub editors sent a missive back to him saying, look, this is what we do. And we save your ass every week, basically. <laughs> yeah. um, but most, you know, if you're on a, if you're on a, like, you know, a newspaper or even if you're on a magazine and you're just working with like, you know, not famous journalists, they hand the copy over and, and then it is yours. And when I, you know, I've had a career in journalism going back, goodness knows how long. And when I file, when I've written and I file copy, that's it, it's gone. I've sent it back to the commissioning editor. It's out of my hands. They're gonna pass it on to the sub editor. My head is already somewhere else. You know, yeah, what am yeah. I gonna write about next? I don't care what's happened once I've filed mm. copy. As a freelance, I'm just thinking, now pay me. <laughs> I've done my bit you, yeah. you commissioned me to write something I've sent it back to you now just pay me I don't care what happens to it down the line mm -hmm. um so, so yeah that you know for journalists whether they're staff or in-house that's that's part of the process you you write you hand it back to the commissioning editor um and they pass it on to the subs desk and then it's ours um and we will do what we want to it within within reason, obviously, and within the framework of um, the legalities and within the framework of the house style guide and everything. Um, but it's ours um, and we can we can kind of do what we want with it. You know, I might decide to chop 500 words out of something because it's flabby, mm. for mm. example, um, if I was doing that for you know, an independent author whose book I had agreed to edit, I would not be doing that at all. I would be sending them suggestions about yeah. you might want to yeah. tighten this chapter, et cetera. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dare to cut something like that. But in journalism, it's it's different. You have carte blanche to really just go ahead and chop things up and just make make them make them readable. Make people make your readers want to keep reading because it's more like a line edit, it sounds like, than a copy it, it edit. It is, that but it's more than that because I'm not just doing the line edit. I might be moving whole paragraphs right. around. Yeah. Like Developmental times, structural work. Yeah. The number, the number of times I've had a story on, on the table from a reporter who's been to last night's council meeting or something, and you know, they're talking about, you know, the council discuss this budget or that budget or whatever and then you get three quarters of the way down of their raw copy and you suddenly discover that there was the verbal equivalent of a punch-up between two <laughs> councillors <laughs> hey, that's much more interesting you know yeah. it's like you yeah. know councillors at war with each other over their social services budget or whatever yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the point where i'll go right that's actually the most interesting bit of the story the opening stuff is really dry and dull we put the punch-up stuff at the beginning that pulls readers in you write a really you know juicy headline to go with that um and that's what keeps people reading so you might often be completely changing a story around um and taking something that was at the end of it and putting it at the yeah. beginning or something yeah. so i awesome. i would have carte blanche to do that that's part of my job is to make it make the readers want to keep reading it. And especially these days when everyone's like really time poor and they might just be skimming the first two or three paragraphs of the news mm -hmm. story yeah. and not reading it all the way to the bitter end. Um, and you need to make sure that all the important information is actually in those first few paragraphs because there is a good chance that a lot of people won't read the rest. So mm, it's really, mm. it's our job to make sure that when people open that page on the internet, that they can get a good grasp of the story immediately even better if you're reading the news online your headline and stand first that encourages you to click through will just do just that it will encourage you to click through and go oh my goodness that looks like a really good story tell people louise that. what a stand first is for those who stand don't know. first is a little bit of introductory test text underneath the headline which just gives you a little bit more information about the story yeah. i'm just going to find you a good example so um 
let me just, I've, I've got a newspaper open on here. Uh, so for example, um, this is the front page of the Guardian's website this morning. Um, there's a headline saying, people think it's more for boys. And underneath the little stand bus says, brownies to learn coding in bid to involve more girls in technology. So that just gotcha. gives you a right. little bit extra flavor of what's going to be in the article. Um, and if I actually click that open, um, the headline actually then says brownies to learn coding in bid to involve more girls in technology. So that stand first on the home page of the newspaper has now become the headline. And ah. the stand first on the page itself now yeah. says research shows that more than half of girls think science and technology careers are preserved of boys. So mm -hmm. and then and then underneath that, you've got the story and you would go straight into it. Yeah, so it's drawing people in, in no. encouraging them to, to click through and then read more about Absolutely. having juicy, Absolutely. enticing even, info. Even yeah. in a print edition, I would expect to see a really good headline and a really good stand first that would make me think I want to read that rather than literally turning the page and seeing what's on the next page. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, but we also, we also do legal stuff as well, which is something that copy mm. editors generally don't do I mean if I've been working on a you know fic fiction for an independent author there might be an issue with real people appearing in the story and things that might potentially be libelous um, as a sub-editor um, that responsibility lies with me to actually do something about it with an independent author I would just flag it and say yeah. I would strongly advise you to get a lawyer to check this over it's potentially defamatory etc on, on when I'm working on a, on a publication, um, that's my responsibility is, oh, okay, that could, that could get us sued. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly with um, court stories, you know, you're reporting yeah. crime or whatever. It's really, yeah. really important that someone who has been arrested or charged, um, it, everything that they've done or everything that they are is described as alleged. So it might be the alleged rapist or, Mr. Smith allegedly assaulted a young girl, that kind of thing. Everything mm -hmm. has to be alleged until they are actually convicted in, in a court of law. Everything can only be described as alleged. So that's that's something that we're really on the whole time. We're looking to make sure that you don't describe somebody as if they had been convicted when they haven't been. It also applies to other things. Like There are really strict rules around um, reporting things that haven't gone to court and might never go to court but for example if a father had assaulted his child um, and was then arrested you might have a, a story where you would have to say a man aged 50 was arrested at such and such an address um, and it would it might be clear from the the rest of the story that the child was at the same address but you can't say that the person who was arrested at that address is the father it would be immediately clear to the reader that it was possibly a case of incest or something you know mm -hmm. really sensitive sensitive yeah. stuff um that carries all kinds of you know le legal implications in terms of like you know charging people with offenses and so on but you can't you can't identify a child that's the thing the, the rules are there around not identifying a child so in a case like that you've got to be really really careful how everything is worded and the reporter might not have been that meticulous so that's the kind of thing that sub editors really really need to pick up and they might might need to do quite a bit of rewriting around that to make sure that the law is complied with and that a child cannot be identified and child in this context means anybody under the age of 18. Louise, Louise, how, Louise how, oh jeez. Oh, <laughs> We both want two, to ask questions. Yeah, I've got, I've got two questions so around this. So uh, have right. I. weird. I wonder if they're the same. Yeah, so my first question is, um, are, if, if, if you were to fall foul of this and you, and you let something through that you shouldn't have, are you individually responsible for it or is it the, uh, the newspaper itself? And it would, if so... It would, it would uh, usually be the publication. Right, uh, okay. There's a more of a grey area there if you're freelance and you're actually a writer. Right. Um, because, you know, it would go to publication and then if somebody objected, especially if it was somebody litigious like a celebrity or a businessman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they might then start a lawsuit, but publication, publication's 
generally but occasionally don't stand by their freelancers right and there have been instances where freelance writers have found themselves cast to the wind by the uh-huh. publication going well yeah. you wrote it da 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 it's your problem Mo- most publications wouldn't do that they would stand by their writers mm-hmm. and, right and fund the legal side um Okay. Sorry, can my, go back to the question? So my, my other question was, um, so yeah, that that's, so generally you're supported by the publication. My yeah. other question is, do you have training for this? How do um, you, how do you learn this? Um, I, I learned on the job. I was right. thrown in at the deep end. Um, I took a career break in my mid twenties to go and finish my education because I left school at 16 and then I got to the age of 23 and decided I wanted to get a degree. Um, and when I graduated, I went down to London um, and I was offered a job on a publication. I knew the editor personally and he said, I'll oh, come and work for me. And when I arrived there, I discovered that I wasn't going to be writing. I was going to be sub editing. Um, and I really got chucked in at the deep end because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. The only time I had edited before that was when at the very beginning of my career, um, when I worked on a, a weekly What's On magazine. So we had news and features at the front and then the second half of the publication was all the listings for theatre cinema music etc and one of my jobs was obviously to like interview bands and stuff so we had nice features about the bands that were playing in the city and so on but on press day one of my jobs was to go up and down to the typesetters down the street and bring back the copy. Um, and then I learned how to sit there with literally a blue pencil, that lovely cliche from 40 uh-huh. years ago, <laughs> yeah. um, sit there with a blue pencil and mark everything up that needed to be fixed. And then t- I would have to take all these rolls of copy back to the typesetter um, and get them, get them amended and then bring back the fresh lot. So I spent a lot of time on press day running up and down the street, clutching huge rolls of typeset <laughs> uh, typeset copy for all over the magazine so that was my only previous experience was learning a little bit about proofreading and some really kind of basic bsi proof marks and then suddenly 10 years later i found myself working on this magazine and being asked to edit it and i didn't have a clue what i was doing it was really quite frightening um, but when you get thrown in at the deep end, you learn very quickly. Um, and mm-hmm. then I discovered I was actually really rather good at it. So I kept doing it. <laughs> so you've answered my, well, I had two questions as well. And you've answered, that was Denise and I had uh, both interested in the, the training aspect. But I want to go back to this um, sort of responsibility issue, legal responsibility issue. Mm-hmm. So if freelancers um, are... I mean, how do you, would would a, a freelance subed have insurance? Is that something like some, oh, some sort I, of a... I do. I I have had indemnity insurance ever since I went freelance, just to cover my back. Yeah. Um, I felt for a long time that I probably wouldn't need it, and then eventually I thought actually I probably ought, ought to get it. Um, so I am covered for it. Um, I've generally not worked on the kind of publications, at least remotely, where I could make a really terrible error and find that there was a legal issue. Um, When I've been when I've done freelance shifts in house, there's always somebody else there to have a chat with. You know, when I was on the the local paper pre pandemic, if I felt something might be a bit iffy, I would have a quick chat with the deputy editor and then we would sort of decide between us. right we'll just we'll cut that or or we'll change it or whatever um so you're not generally operating in a a vacuum there was one time when i i worked um remotely for about 18 months for a guardian spin-off publication called contributoria um and one of my jobs obviously with that was to um look out for anything legally iffy and there was only one occasion actually during that whole time where I came up against something. And of course, it happened to be the month that the people who were in charge of running this had both decided to go on holiday. Oh, and they no. oh, God. But I did. They did leave me the, the contact details for a media lawyer in case I did actually need some backup. And. I did contact him and he looked at what I'd sent over and said, yes, good point. I don't think we're going to run that this month. And we decided to shelve it. Um, that was the only time in that for that particular publication in that 18 month window that I actually needed to have that kind of support. But mm-hmm. when I when I worked in-house shifts at the paper, um, 
you know, earlier this decade, then, um, yeah, that was absolutely a case of if there was anything iffy coming up, I would have a chat with the, the deputy editor and we would make a decision jointly about it. Mostly I'd be making those decisions by myself. And of course, like any self-respecting sub-editor, I have the Bible on my desk, which is McNay's Essential Law for Journalists. And it basically covers all of the media law so if you're not sure of anything there's something you can dip into um, much like you might dip into a style guide or butcher's mm -hmm. editing copy editing guide things like that it's just you have it on your desk it's updated every two years so there's also you know, a responsibility for you to make sure you have the latest edition when it comes out because the law does change every yeah. so often and also how the law is interpreted might change because things might go through the courts and and so on um so that's that's kind of the bible you need to have that especially if you're working remotely and you're not entirely sure of something i that would be my first port of call for checking any any you know contentious legal issue um, we should probably make it clear though that that's for uk subs isn't it yes yes um, mm -hmm. the yes. other countries will have their own um, well even even in the Bible. uk um you know you've got you've got different legal jurisdictions i'm you know i live in england of course, of course, um, yes, i'm covered yeah. by english and welsh law yeah. um if i was Northern if Ireland. i was working in scotland well, which i yeah. had done at the beginning of my career um i would be working under a scottish jurisdiction and the law i actually wouldn't even know what the law is in scotland if i was going to go and work there now i would have mm. to it's completely on different scottish on so many things yeah quickly. so mm -hmm. yes i can only talk about the jurisdiction that i i work in and that's england mm -hmm. and wales but it's really that is so important um you know just to me that's really the standout thing and the, one of the standout things the difference between copy editing and sub editing is this mm. legal responsibility yeah. Yeah. that you have and that's that's a big consideration for it's people a, mm -hmm. it's a huge responsibility mm. because we are the last line of defense and often with newspaper budgets and magazine budgets paired to the bone these days Things may not even necessarily get proofread again once they've yeah. been subbed and put on the page. Mm -hmm. So it, we are that last line of defence. It's our responsibility to get it right, because if we don't and it triggers legal action, which obviously could be really expensive, mm -hmm. you're really in trouble then. So you have to, you have to know this stuff and you've got to know what you're doing with it. Um, and that's, you know, when I'm working for other clients away from the media, I, that's a responsibility I'm really glad I don't have. But obviously, with a lot of things, I would still be looking to, you know, to flag something that might be legally iffy, but then it would be the author's responsibility. Yeah, you're, you've mine. still got that eye on it, but you don't yeah. have the, the need to do anything about yeah. it other than flag it's, it. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because the journalist's name is at the top of that article. In yeah. the media, yeah. but the but the responsibility, that huge responsibility, is borne by the sub editor. Yeah, yeah, um, we're the unsung, <laughs> we're the unsung heroes. We yeah, really, are really. Because, you know, when I work on somebody's feature, um, the thing with a lot of journalists is they they're really good at getting a story, but they don't necessarily know how to write, and that that is very true across the board I would say is that a lot of journalists they're good at getting a story but they're actually quite quite poor writers and that's one reason why sub editors do what we do and we have carte blanche to kind of you know chop things up and move them around and rewrite them and shorten things uh, and all that. So Louise um, it's quite clear that there are a lot of differences with some overlap as you said between copy editing and sub editing how easy would you say it is to transfer from copy editing to sub editing and and what advice would you give to anyone looking to move into this field um, are there good resources that our listeners should dig into because I'm thinking that that the lingo is a bit different and they may need to get themselves up to speed with some of that mm -hmm. yeah the, I mean the lingo is is really different we have our <laughs> we have our own own language on the subs desk and mm -hmm. much of which is completely impenetrable to anyone who doesn't <laughs> work in in the press um, you know, we talk about NIBS, which is a short story, literally news in brief. It's an acronym for news in brief. You know, yeah. you can be in a, you could be sitting on the subs desk in a magazine and people would be talking about NIBS and flat plans. That's the that's the, the, the page design for the whole publication. You decide what goes on page five, six, seven, eight, etc., um, and where the ads would go. Um, we talked, we talk about a splash, which is the 
front page story. That's the main story on the front page. Mm -hmm. um, all kinds of things like that. The journalist's name is by, they get a byline. That's their credit. The subs don't get one, by the way. They're the unsung heroes mm -hmm. behind them. Um, mm -hmm. There's all this lingo. And I, I grew up with all that um, when I started working. And then sort of 17 years ago, when I started freelancing as a copy editor, I was completely baffled by terms that are used in publishing because they're so different. Mm. I didn't know what a solidus was, um, which I right. saw being talked about on the forum for the Chartered Institute of Editing and Proofreading. I was like, what the hell is a solidus? <laughs> I went away and looked up, oh, oh, it's a slash, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, there's all these, there's two different lots of jargon. I didn't know what a folio was. Um, right. You know, think really yeah. basic stuff like that so yeah if, if you're going to go from copy editing to subbing I would say get some training there are some really really good training courses out there you can some of them are online um you know with classroom training over zoom and and so on um you could probably you could probably do a good training course for under a thousand pounds um there's also a very very good book that I keep on my desk again um Sub editing and production for journalists by Tim Holmes. Um, and I have the second edition, which is the most recent one. Um, and again, that's like a little Bible. It's a bit like, I would say it's the equivalent of Butcher's copy editing. Right. Um, it's okay. an absolute Bible. It will guide you through a lot of the process on there. It gives lots of really, really good examples of how you would do something as a sub editor on a particular kind of story or whatever. So we can put a link to that in the show notes, Louise, so that people can, mm -hmm. can find it. If you Yeah, along with McNay's as well. And, yeah. Yes, um, McNay's as yeah. well. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say if you're going to go into sub editing, those are the, along with all the usual sort of decent dictionaries and, mm -hmm. you know, spelling, spelling dictionaries and all that kind of stuff. Um, and things like Swan's Practical English Usage, which are all mm -hmm. just good stuff for editors to have anyway. Um, mm -hmm. For specific subbing, I would say you need McNay's and you need the Tim Holmes Sub Editing and Production Guide. Um, and that will guide you through an awful lot. But I think also you really just need to go and get training. I didn't have any when I started. I was just chucked in at the deep end and learned on the job. And afterwards, sort of two or three years down the line, I had learned a hell of a lot but I really wish that someone had just sent me even for one day to get a bit of training somewhere mm. so I could have had a bit of a grasp of what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I don't think there's any substitute really for training. Just go out there and get it. Um, I think that really mirrors, sorry, Louise, we are talking over each other a lot in this episode. <laughs> um, I think that really mirrors um, what we're seeing with editing and copy editing, proofreading in that, you know, the in-house experience that people learned from mm -hmm. years ago just isn't available to, to people now because of yeah. the cuts to, uh, you know, in-house budgets and yeah. you know, many fewer posts available. So that's what I was thinking. I was yeah. thinking actually realistically these days, how likely are you to be given that kind of work? as a kind of on the job training, Louise, you know, like in the way you were, is that likely to happen these days? Or are they more likely to get someone who's done some training? You know, if you if you're looking to get work in this field, yeah. um, you're probably <laughs> Do you, do you think that it's it, you're less likely to be able to follow that kind of a, initial path that you took of kind of just, I'm yeah, going to the I, deep end, I'll see what happens. I, I would say these days that, you know, if you, if you were going to work in house as a staffer, um on the subs desk um yeah i don't they used to you know at the beginning back in you know 40 odd years ago at the beginning of that kind of career um you would be the junior sub and you would be trained on the subs desk by the other subs that already mm -hmm. had Mm -hmm. that wealth of experience under their belts so you would kind of learn on the job like that but it would be it would be very intensive and really really good quality training um these days that doesn't really happen I think I think these days on a lot of publications you know somebody who's working in-house as a writer if they show a bit of interest in subbing they might move over there you know to do a shift or two and then suddenly find they're being offered actual like you know regular work on the subs desk um, and a lot of us who've gone from writing into subbing do find it really satisfying and enjoyable and it's a good it's a good career shift but I but for freelancers no one is going to offer you that in-house um, and if you want the training you're going to have to pay for it but then mm. as editors 
you know, we talk about the, the, the importance of CPD all the time and the need to stay, stay ahead with our skills and everything. And I would say, even if you have absolutely no interest whatsoever in working on press publications, it can still be worthwhile to do a sub editing course because it will broaden your skill set. And it's particularly good if you go into working with corporates because, you know, mm -hmm. you might you might end up doing some editorial work for a large company and they want you to do their annual report and their nice brochures and, yeah. you know, other regular reports and so on. And if you've got the sub editing skills, um, you can bring that to, you know, basically managing it a whole publication for a company mm -hmm. um, and being able to advise them on all the kinds of things that they need and you would be able to work with the page designer to make magic happen so it's it's they are very transferable skills mm -hmm. and you probably wouldn't would... need them if you were just working with fiction author yeah. um, mm -hmm. but so useful for other kinds of editing particularly if you're working with companies Mm. And digital comms as well, because these days, yes. what you were talking about earlier, that that need to get people's attention, hook them in quickly right, by putting the top information, you know, ab above the digital fold, that, mm -hmm. that's all really good for digital comms. And of course, our whole world doesn't matter. I mean, every business now has digital comms of some sort. Um, yeah. So you're, you're being able to, to being, being aware of, of, of how to make copy compelling quickly yeah. um, is a massively valuable skill that that that's a, a sort of essential it sounds from what you've said to sub-editing work and yet it's not necessarily something that you learn to do as as a copy editor mm -hmm. so I can really see how that's th those are really useful skills to have just and for your own business actually if you're a, a professional mm -hmm. editor mm -hmm. knowing how to write great compelling grab grab worthy coffee copy coffee yeah coffee? There's, there's that as yeah. well <laughs> so say coffee. <laughs> digital copy for your website yeah who doesn't need that yeah exactly exactly yeah. although if you're writing your own web copy i would still recommend getting somebody else to edit it for you sure. oh definitely yeah <laughs> oh yes we all know about we've all learned the hard way yeah. exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> Louise, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, you've been in the editing game for a long time now. Um, can we talk a little bit about how you think it's changed over the years, especially for freelancers? Oh, goodness. Well, when I, when I started out as a journalist, I was 16. That was 44 years ago. So I have seen an awful lot of changes in that weekly magazine where I started my career. Um, we literally typed everything on secondhand Remingtons in the newsroom, um, which is why my fingernails have been ruined for life. Um, <laughs> and then everything, every, you know, everything would be pulled out of the typewriter roller and it would all be collated and it would go down the road to the typesetting company and it would come back on nice little rolls of paper that we would proofread. And when we were satisfied that all the, the copy was correct, which might mean two or three trips to the typesetter, we would then paste it up by hand. And then mm. those pasted up pages would go to the printer. Um, yeah, Gosh. that's how it was done for yeah. ages. And with yeah. newspapers, you would have you would have lead type. This is why we talk about hot metal. Um, mm -hmm. And what, also why we talk about uppercase and lowercase for the simple reason that newspaper typesetters kept the capital letters. They had a, like a they had like a little wooden box that would open out, and on the top half of the inside of the box would be all the capital letters. And on the bottom half of the box would be all the lowercase letters. Oh. And that's why they're called uppercase and lowercase, because that's where they sat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Physically. Um, but yeah, old, you know, old style newspapers, um, everything would be everything would be typeset in hot metal. And you and you had to be able to read letters backwards because that's how you were setting yeah. the pages. That's another skill that you don't actually need anymore. Yeah. Um so yeah, we've we've gone from all that to moving into you know I I started working on computers around 1989 I think when I when I was working on the weekly magazine where I did four shifts a week as a freelance for about 18 months I was there and I was on computers there we were on Windows 3.1 or something and so we would you know we the articles that were being filed for us would arrive in the system and we would edit them in Word on those computers 
we would then print them off and again we would paste everything by hand but about nine months after I was there they decided that they were going to have us designing the pages as well and we all had to learn Quark Express really quickly and right. suddenly I went from being a sub-editor to being a layout sub-editor and not just working on the copy but also making it look really nice on the page as well mm -hmm. um and that's a whole other skill set. And digital yeah. subs these days will be able to work with software like Quark Express or InDesign. Um, things that, you know, 40 years ago would have been absolutely unthinkable, but they're just completely routine and commonplace now. Um, most publications now use InDesign to lay out their pages. It's, I've, it's, things have changed hugely. Everything, everything is digital now. It's, it's really rare to see anything printed off and checked over and then go back for amending again on a digital system. It just doesn't happen. Did you get a sense, Louise, when, when you started working in a, sort of the more sort of digital thing using um, Word and using computers did you get a sense of just how much things did you feel that you were on the cusp of something at that point of how no. things were going to change <laughs> yeah it was just another thing to do was it yeah no it's just the change happens all the time in any industry and it's yeah. like, suddenly it's like oh we're not working on Remington's anymore we have to write on a computer um mm -hmm. And you just you just learn it and you just mm. run with it. You don't really have any choice. In industries move on all the time, not, yeah. not just publishing. Um, so you just, you know, change comes in and it might be it might be difficult at first until you get the hang of it. Um, but you learn it and mm. you know, and you do it. And then a few years later, something else comes in, like page layout software, like Quark Express, and you learn that as well. And these are all good skills to have though. Even though I haven't worked on a page in Quark Express for probably a couple of decades, knowing how to do it still gives me that extra support in my mm. general skill set because mm. I have the understanding of how that works. Um, so, yeah, is, massive change, massive change. Isn't um, it interesting how, though, it used to be the case that, you know, you had people dealing with the text, people dealing with the layout, mm -hmm. people dealing with the this or that, and, and mm -hmm. it's all could become consolidated so that that you've got much more chance it feels like what you're saying if you the more skills you've got the, the more likely you are to be able to break into this because you can say yeah, yeah I can handle that I can handle that I know how yeah. a page I know how to I know how to make a page work yeah visually I, I would as, agree you, you cannot have too many skills so even if you've learned something 20 years ago that's now become obsolete um, because of technological changes you still got that experience tucked away yeah. in the back of your mm -hmm. head yeah. and and it's still it, it still gives you that broader perspective the downside of all that is when you've got all these different skills and you're working in an industry where everything has been paired back to the bone and you are the one person who is the last line of defense if it fucks up it's on your shoulders yeah 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 <laughs> and that's a big big responsibility knowing mm -hmm. that you might be the only person you know and and you fuck it up um mm -hmm. and then it, it will come back to you so it's yeah it's good to have that broad skill set but there are the downsides that go with it as well when you're not working with so many other people because yeah. you said just now louise you know there used to be someone who did the pages someone who designed the stuff and everything with sub editors today they might be doing all of that yeah you know, which is a good reminder to any listeners to make sure that you've checked out what insurance you need for your jurisdiction and yes. you know just be you know go go in with a with an open mind and a broad mind about about what what's actually involved in this because it's 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 not it's not the same as copy editing it's really not it's not the same as working for an indie author on on a book that they're going to publish on amazon it's it's a whole different potential it is. yeah it is. I, I would say absolutely, you know, if you're going to spend money on, on CPD and spend money on training and you want to move into this area, spend the money on a good course. There are, there are some very good courses out there that, you know, are like half a dozen modules or something. And one of those will just cover all the legal stuff, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, they, these courses um, cover a huge range of, of things that you will encounter as a sub editor, including the legal stuff. Um, and they're usually they're usually accredited courses and at NCTJ, which is the National Council for the Training of Journalists, still oversees the vast majority of training of all kinds that journalists will do. Um, and a good sub editing course will be accredited to the NCTJ. Um, and then you know that it will be a really 
good quality course mm -hmm. actually uh, i would say you know you could spend six or eight hundred pounds that's money well invested um you could certainly be paying a lot more for something at the publishing training center for example um mm -hmm. for a different kind of training course so i think i think that sort of money is good good value um and given that if you're freelance you can earn two to three hundred pounds a day on a shift it would pay for itself really quickly yeah yeah, yeah. That's a I really think good way of thinking of it. Yeah, it? In terms of and, like, it's not about what you spend; it's an investment in what you can earn. Exactly. Your, 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 yeah, your, your yeah. yeah. And I think it's really um, um, worth um, just reminding listeners about what you said there, Louise, about how your skills changed over the years and how important it is to to move with the times because mm -hmm. we do know we we do see colleagues saying, "Well, that's the way I've always done it, and I'm not going to yeah. change." And you know, and you're just I think you run the risk of um becoming obsolete really if you don't update your skills and mm. be open to new opportunities in terms of technology or developments yeah. I think um, it's yeah it's mm. absolutely a mistake Where, mm. wherever you're what, what, whatever field you're you're editing in what kinds of skills you're using whether it's you know mainstream publishers or indie authors or you know the press or whatever it's really a mistake to go well that's the way I've always done it I'm not going to change you have to because everything changes the industry will keep changing and if you don't stay up to date with it you will find that the amount of work you're being offered will shrink yeah so, yeah yeah, yeah training is really important yeah yeah it's core really isn't it, it louise is. this has been absolutely brilliant i think we've both learned so much because so sub editing is just it's completely foreign to both of us so we really appreciate your sharing all your many years of experience with us and the good news is you're coming back and we're going to be talking about the language of illness so yeah. i think everyone's going to learn a lot from that too yeah, yeah. um so we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Uh, you can rate, review and subscribe to us via Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whichever platform you prefer. Yeah, thank you so much for listening. Now, if you'd like to help support the editing podcast, you can join our Patreon community for as little as three quid a month and get exclusive access to live Q&As for just a few pounds more. Yeah, we'd absolutely love to have you on board. So if you're interested, just hop over to patreon.com forward slash editing podcast. And we'll include that link in the show notes too. So she's been Louise. And she's been Louise. And the other one's been Denise. Join <laughs> us again soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.